Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast. In this episode, we'll discuss one of the bullets known as PV-20, which was removed from the body of Sheila Caffell during the post-mortem, and how both the description and the physical form of the bullet changed over time. We ask if the bullet was switched by the time of Jeremy Bamber's trial, what the possible reasons might have been for that to have happened. The post-mortem examinations of Neville Bamber and Sheila Caffell took place on the 7th of August 1985 at Chelmsford and Essex Hospital. Neville's post-mortem was held in the afternoon and lasted just 45 minutes. Sheila's was next and concluded early that evening. There were a number of individuals who were present for both examinations. They included the Home Office pathologist Dr Peter Venesis and his assistant together with DI Robert Miller, DI Ronald Cook and DS Neil Davidson, DC Hammersley, DC David Bird, PC Wynne and the coroner's officer PC Norman Wright. It's noticeably odd that the post-mortem examinations took place without a ballistics expert being present or even being consulted at any stage. During the post-mortem examinations of Sheila, notes were made along with photographs and x-rays being taken. Much of this material has never been disclosed to Jeremy's legal team and this has obstructed the defence pathology experts in conducting their work. The autopsy notes are not complete and there remains a substantial number of photographs and x-ray images which are still hidden by police. In recent years, Jeremy's legal team came into possession of several x-ray images taken of Sheila at the post-mortem. By the time she was removed from White House Farm, she'd sustained two bullet wounds, one in her neck and another under her chin. One bullet had lodged in the tissue of her neck, which Dr. Venesis stated would not have killed her outright, and he confirmed that she would have been able to stand and walk after sustaining it. The second bullet went straight into her brain, killing her instantly. Although Dr. Venesis had been told it was a murder suicide, he had to base his evidence on findings from the bodies. He could only conclude that Sheila had inflicted both injuries herself. Therefore, he assumed quite wrongly that the non-fatal shot must have been the first, with the second fatal shot fired afterwards. This is the only reason for his comment that Sheila would have been able to move around after what he assumed was the first gunshot injury. On the 7th of May 1986, Dr. Venesis made a supplementary statement to the police when he was asked very clearly to speculate on what effect the non-fatal wound would have had on Sheila. He described how the jugular vein had been lacerated, which would have caused a substantial loss of blood. The question of the deceased Sheila Caffell leaving the bedroom, let alone returning, is in my view totally out of the question. Dr. Venesis believed the second fatal shot occurred very shortly after the first non-fatal shot. However, had he been told that Sheila had only fired the gun once, which would have killed her instantly, and that an individual at the scene had accidentally discharged the rifle as they removed it from her body, causing the wound described as non-fatal, his conclusions would have been very different. On examination of the x-ray images, the bullet in Sheila's neck, which was the non-fatal injury, is visibly shattered into multiple pieces, of which at least 15 individual fragments can be seen. Dr. Venesis noted this bullet, which he referenced as PV-20, fragmented on striking the bone. In his report, he went further and said, the bullet in Sheila's neck fragmented upon impact with the cervical vertebrae. This bullet was then supposedly submitted to Huntington Forensic Science Laboratory on the 30th of August 1985 and was given to the Home Office ballistics expert, 
Malcolm Fletcher to examine. This bullet PV20 was given an additional reference number of item 61 at the laboratory and the description of Sheila Kefell, right side of neck. Malcolm Fletcher gave evidence in his witness statement dated the 13th of November 1985. The recovered bullets and bullet fragments were compared microscopically with test bullets fired in the rifle, 18. The results of these tests are detailed in the following table. The diagram Malcolm Fletcher provided to accompany the statement said Exhibit number 61 Bullet recovered from Sheila Kefell, right side of neck. Description of recovered bullet, hole. Result of bullet comparison with tests from the rifle, 18. Strongly suggestive that Fletcher was confirming the bullet PV20 came from the 2-2 rifle used during the incident. However, Malcolm Fletcher described this bullet as being whole, not fragmented. How was that possible when the pathologist described it as being in at least 15 different pieces, which can be seen on the X-ray images very clearly? Malcolm Fletcher was provided with the X-rays, which he confirmed by referencing them in his statement, and he didn't mix this up with the other bullet recovered from Sheila, as this was referenced as item 60, which he also described as whole. Therefore, how could a fragmented bullet become whole again? The bullets were exhibited at the trial, and again, both were whole, which meant that the jury were being deceived. But why would this happen? What possible reason was there for manipulating the evidence regarding the bullet? Was it because this was the shot fired by the police and the angle of the shot, if examined in any detail, would have proven that it was the second shot fired accidentally by a police officer after Sheila had taken her own life? We believe that it's possible that either one or both bullets recovered from Sheila were swapped at some stage with other bullets that were taken from rounds found at the farm or in Malcolm Fletcher's test firing experiments. It's quite possible that Fletcher mixed up the bullets when he was conducting his tests, but no matter what the reason, it's shocking that a fragmented bullet was presented as whole to the jury at Jeremy Bamber's trial. This is a serious issue which only Essex Police and Malcolm Fletcher can explain. At the trial, the judge, Justice Drake, informed the jury that it was inconceivable that Sheila committed the killings and that would have involved her attaching a silencer to the gun, fighting in the kitchen, going upstairs, shooting herself once with the silencer attached to the rifle, going back downstairs, putting the silencer away in a cardboard box in the gun cupboard and then going back upstairs to shoot herself with the fatal shot. It was crucial to the prosecution's case that the silencer was on the gun and it would make perfect sense to swap the bullets in case there was a difference in the marks present on them when fired through a silencer or through the rifle with no silencer attached. The prosecution claimed that Jeremy Bamber inflicted both wounds to Sheila with the silencer attached and yet the accidental discharge of the rifle by police was done without the silencer on the gun. Of course, there could be other reasons why this bullet was swapped, but this seems to be the most likely. Not only was the physical appearance of the bullet different than Dr. Vinicius had described and the x-rays had shown, but the weight of the bullets was not correct. According to Ely, the manufacturers of the hollow point bullets Neville purchased in 1984, each bullet should have weighed 2.27 grams. Malcolm Fletcher made records regarding his testing of the bullet weights that were disclosed to the defence in 2001. His report stated that the recovered bullet, PV20, weighed just 1.54 grams. On the 12th of September 1985, Malcolm Fletcher had conducted firearms testing at Huntington Laboratory. He didn't make reference to this in his witness statements, but he recorded the testing on forensic documents. Bullet from 9.3, 35 grains, 
slash 2.27 grams. This is the weight of a whole bullet. The weight of the fragmented bullet recovered from Sheila was recorded as 23.83 grains, 1.54 grams, and yet it was presented in Fletcher's evidence and at trial as being whole. The discrepancy in the weight has never been explained. On the conclusion of the trial, the defence ballistics expert Major Mead, who surprisingly was not called to provide evidence for reasons only known to Mr Rivlin, Jeremy's QC, contacted the defence regarding Malcolm Fletcher's evidence at trial. The scientific evidence given by Fletcher in his trial testimony was noted in an internal memo written by Kingsley Napley where they discuss the opinion of Major Mead, a far more experienced ballistics expert. The memo stated, Fletcher's evidence was scientifically irresponsible and Major Mead feels that Fletcher ought to lose his job over it. But this was not the only other expert who was willing to write about the evidence of Malcolm Fletcher. In 2010, an expert for the defence stated that the evidence should be called into serious question and that serious doubts exist as to the accuracy of the firearms report. The expert continued, the firearms report of Malcolm D. Fletcher, particularly with regard to the examination of the projectiles recovered from Sheila, is very concerning. He states that he reviewed Dr. Vinicius's report and reviewed the x-rays, which state that the bullet in Sheila's neck fragmented upon impact with the cervical vertebrae. However, Mr. Fletcher's report in two places says that he examined a whole bullet. Given this gross, obvious error, it is recommended that all of his work is reviewed or redone. The Criminal Cases Review Commission did receive the report in the submissions, but it seems it did not feature in their provisional statements of reasons for refusal to send the case back to the Appeal Court in 2011. The defence have not been able to conduct their own tests or have the benefit of analysis conducted by their experts as the material evidence in the case was illegally destroyed in 1996, contrary to a court order. Considering that he was called as the prosecution ballistics expert, Fletcher admitted to DCI Dickinson after the trial that he'd only previously fired a rifle on one occasion, and that had been an air rifle when he was a teenager. Further to this revelation, Malcolm Fletcher did not pass his firearms examinations diploma until 1997, 12 years after Jeremy Bamber was convicted on his evidence. The 2010 defence ballistics experts informed the defence that Fletcher does not seem to have had the background that would qualify him to give the evidence he gave. The evidence we have discussed here raises several questions for which neither Malcolm Fletcher nor Essex Police have ever provided a satisfactory explanation for. The questions are as follows. Where did the substituted bullet come from? Who manufactured it? Was it from White House Farm, the Essex Police Armoury? or fired from a police-issue gun? Was it from bullet stocks at Huntingdon Forensic Laboratories? When was the original PV-20 bullet swapped with this rogue substitute? And how did Malcolm Fletcher fail to identify the original bullet PV-20 as being fragmented and had been switched for a whole bullet? Was the substituted bullet switched with a whole bullet not made by the same manufacturer as all the other bullets in the case? Here we've set out the evidence relating to this issue, which demonstrates that Essex Police and or members of the Forensic Science Service have manipulated the case evidence and deceived the trial judge and jury for reasons they've yet to explain. Mm -hmm.